Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session, a special session by the Partnership for Economic Policy. I am Jean Mariara. I'm the Executive Director of the Partnership for Economic Policy. Our session is titled, What Can We Run From? Inclusive Adaptation and Recovery Policies Are Responding to the COVID-19 Crisis. In PEP, we uh, provide local evidence for local solutions. We believe that uh, in-country development challenges require locally devised solutions. And this is what we do best. This is what we are very proud of. Uh, what we do is that we produce high quality research from a local perspective. Uh, we build bridges between research and policy. We strengthen local capacity both for research and policy engagement. Then we boost project visibility and impact on policy uh, through uh, dissemination activities. And then finally, we create connections for knowledge sharing across the group. Since 2002, we've worked in uh, 64 countries where we have funded research. We've uh, supported more than 350 uh, projects and 40% of them are low-income countries and more than a thousand researchers, 50% of whom are women. Something that we are very proud of because uh, the issue of gender parity, as we do, is not to say, especially uh, among economists or in economic interventions. PEP, uh, we support the researchers uh, using a very intensive running and doing a grant support program where we give researchers not just money, but uh, we ensure that uh, we invest in them very heavily. And the end result of this is uh, um, very high quality research and also uh, policy engaged research that involves local government institutions and policy makers who actually understand the local context very well. Turning to the project at heart, about which my panelists will be talking about, we have uh, what we call the core project or COVID-19 responses for equity, uh, funded by the International Development Research Center of Canada. And the aim of this project is uh, fourfold. First, uh, we assess the COVID-19 impacts and effectiveness of existing or potential policy responses. We provide evidence to inform the design of inclusive adaptation and recovery policies. Uh, three, uh, we develop country level uh, relevant tools to guide policy design and reform, and also ensure that uh, the local researchers and government can use these tools. And finally, uh, we identify general reasons that can guide inclusive responses and recovery policies, not just in these countries in question, but also in other developing countries. And really, we believe that uh, the same could also apply in uh, developed countries. Uh, looking at the countries and methodologies, uh, we are using two main approaches in this uh, project. First, we have uh, policy simulations uh, from the micro point of view, micro simulations and macro simulations using computable general equilibrium uh, analysis. For the uh, micro simulations, we have a project in five countries and you'll be hearing about one short tray. That is Argentina, Ecuador, Ethiopia, Ghana and Vietnam. Uh, for the computable general equilibrium analysis, we have Nigeria, we have Zimbabwe, we have Kenya and Tanzania. And finally, uh, for the experimental impact evaluations, we have one project in Ivory Coast and another one in Benin. Uh, we will not be able to talk about all countries in this session. Uh, you hear some flavor of it and then the rest uh, you can uh, follow uh, more information from our website. One thing that I would want to emphasize 
uh, is uh, the approach that we are using in this project, which is also what we are using in other ongoing pet projects, and that is co-production of research. Um, in the PEP core projects, we have rockery red uh, projects uh, through a collaborative approach, whereby we have rocker teams who comprise senior researchers, and we also have government officers as part of the team. And the two uh, sets of teams engage in periodic consultations, first among themselves, and then with uh, target stakeholder institutions to ensure that uh, the project is very well aligned with um, what is happening on the ground. Uh, this approach is very important uh, for several reasons. First, it uh, helps to align research questions with existing country-specific policy needs. Two, uh, it helps to adapt research agenda to evolving policy needs. Three, it helps to increase ownership of results by the target stakeholders. And then finally, uh, all these uh, tend to maximize chances of evidence uptake uh, to inform uh, relevant policy processes. And uh, we have a lot of evidence that this is actually happening. Again, I would refer you to our website for more information. Just a quick example of uh, what I'm talking about here. We have, um, in the case of the Zimbabwe project, uh, the local researcher in uh, this project uh, was actually invited to present uh, the findings to the Minister of Defense and Security, who happened to have been appointed as the chairman of the National COVID-19 Task Force. Uh, this minister immediately uh, presented the findings of this project to the cabinet, and uh, the government um, is now awaiting uh, for the final results of this project uh, so as to implement uh, some of the recommendations uh, in the context of Zimbabwe. And we have uh, many other cases like that. So uh, finally, let me introduce the three panelists that we have uh, this afternoon. Uh, these are our researchers for the core projects and also other pet projects. We have first Guillermo Cruzes, who is the deputy director uh, of CEDRAS in the National University of La Plata in Argentina. He'll be speaking about work based on uh, micro simulations uh, in Argentina, Ecuador, and he also mention about other countries. We have Baka Ahmed, who is the joint executive director of the Sustainable Development Policy Institute in, the, in Pakistan will be talking uh, about experiences from computable general equilibrium analysis. And finally, we have Esther Oguni Adimi, who is a researcher with RADES, University of Paraku, Benin, uh, who will be presenting on impact evaluation. So uh, let me just thank you and note that uh, PEP, we are very thankful to the International Development Research Center for funding this work and other uh, projects within PEP. We are also funded by uh, Hewlett Foundation. Actually, two of the projects, um, uh, the experimental impact evolution projects are building on work that is uh, funded by Hewlett Foundation. And then we also have work that is uh, funded by the Global Affairs Canada. Thank you. I want to invite Guillermo Cruzis to start off uh, with this presentation, then he'll be followed by Baka and Faidani Esther in that order. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much for joining or for listening. Um, thank you very much for uh, organizing this conference and for the invitation. My name is Guillermo Cruces. I'm a researcher affiliated with PEP, the Partnership for Economic Policy, the Center for Distributive Studies at the Universidad Nacional de la Plata in Argentina and the University of Nottingham. Let me give you a little bit of background on the project. <clears throat> As rapid response policies were implemented to mitigate 
the immediate health, economic and social effects of the COVID-19 crisis, developing country populations, and especially those most vulnerable, uh, were at risk of being left behind. In July 2020, Canada's IDRC awarded funding to PEP4 Core, a new COVID-19 crisis recovery research initiative for inclusive adaptation and recovery policies that covered 11 countries in Africa, Asia and South America. I was involved with the two projects in South America, in Argentina and Ecuador, too, from which I will draw some uh, examples and, and lessons. Uh, the originality uh, of the project from PEP's side was that the organization worked directly with teams involving both local researchers and government institutions and, and, and partners were identified ex ante and were directly involved in the formulation of the research questions and of the analysis. So let me show you, um, give you a showcase of the results for Argentina. Um, the research team in Argentina estimated that poverty levels rose to 47.5%, which represented almost 13 percentage points higher than the situation uh, before the pandemic. Um, but what I want to emphasize here is that these estimates were made when uh, there was no official information on the effect of the crisis. And this project was led by Dr. Puig at the, um, at the Center for Distributive Studies in, in La Plata in Argentina. Um, his team uh, found that the policy response in the form of direct cash transfers for most vulnerable households in the country, but also with furlough or, or employment support for those in the formal sector, substantially reduced the impact of the crisis on welfare indicators. For instance, the policy response reduced the poverty rate by 3.16 percentage points. That is, the, increase, the incidence of poverty would have been three point percentage points higher uh, when comparing it with the situation without this response. And this means that 1 million people from a population of 45 million were prevented from falling into poverty uh, by means of these policy responses. And the effect of the crisis, but also the effectiveness of the response was higher for female headed households. Without the emergency cash transfers, the average household income would have fallen by 23%. So <clears throat> what was the type of analysis? Uh, in here we have um, <clears throat> a figure produced by the uh, research team in, in Argentina, um, where we can see poverty and, and Gini inequality um, levels uh, before and after the crisis. These are the team's estimates. Uh, and the main task besides estimating um, the impact of a crisis when there was no official information available yet, besides this important task, uh, the, the team estimated this micro simulated uh, a contrafactual distribution of income um, without the policy response. And, and this is from where uh, the results I quoted uh, a minute ago come from. Here we have, um, here we have also a breakdown uh, by the type of household and we can see that the impact of the crisis uh, was higher um, for female headed households, but also the effectiveness of policies in fighting the effects of the crisis was higher for um, female headed households. The Ecuador team um, also did a similar analysis and showed that the modest emergency transfer from the government, which was uh, substantially lower um, in terms of, of resources uh, than the one in Argentina, uh, had very limited effects. Um, there was a very large impact of the crisis on per capita income with a fall of about 28% and a huge increase in poverty rates, more than doubling, um, which was especially bad for uh, households working in the informal sector. The sectors most affected by the crisis were construction, restaurant and hotels and personal services, and female workers are overrepresented in two, uh, the latter two. Okay. Um, and just to show you the type of analysis that the team uh, conducted, we can see that they derived the whole distribution of, of household per capita income before the crisis, after the crisis, and again, the micro simulated counterfactual of the income distribution without the government assistance. And this is where um, all the results come from, from these comparisons. So um, 
regarding the the results in in other countries, I cannot of course cover the eleven countries here. Um, but all other microanalysis concentrate on employment effects by sector and their impact on poverty. Whereas uh, the countries where uh, PEP <clears throat> developed a macro approach uh, were based on general equilibrium models that gauged the effect through production, tax collections, import, exports, prices, and other mechanisms. And all the documents are available on the PEP website. So what are the salient issues beyond the, the mere sanitary emergency? Um, the social effects of the crisis imply increased poverty and inequality uh, with longer term effects in the form of the loss of capital, human capital, the education of children and hysteresis in, in employment for adults. Uh, and we want to emphasize that we find a gendered impact of the crisis whereby women were certainly more affected in terms of employment and poverty. And there were also very large fiscal impacts that were covered by the more macro studies um, in, in the project. So what are the lessons for the future and, and further analysis uh, regarding the continuing 2021 pandemic? Um, the best option seems to be some combination of direct cash transfers with employment support, but the death of the crisis implies that the targeting has to be very broad to minimize exclusion error at the expense of inclusion error. The crisis was so generalized that the narrow targeting of social policy is certainly not the best way um, to reach all households affected by the crisis, which were much more than what we would have had uh, in a normal recession or crisis. Um, of course, we were um, very adamant in terms of incorporating the gender dimension both in the analysis and in government assistance because female headed households were the most affected by this. Um, in terms of further analysis, um, the gender and impact of the pandemic and, and looking at which sectors were most affected um, and, and how the health reached different um, types of households is very important. And Finally, we think we can derive some policy lessons for developing countries beyond pandemics, both during emergencies and, and, and normal times from the reaction to the pandemic. So um, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, this presentation summarizes the contributions to Partnership for Economic Policy uh, to the project entitled Simulations and Field Experiments of Policy Responses and Interventions to promote inclusive adaptation and recovery from the COVID-19 crisis with the assistance and financial support of IDRC. I hope um, we can meet our esteemed colleagues colleague at WIDER and at uh, other uh, institutions soon in person. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Let me start by uh, thanking the organizers for, uh, for the teams who have been involved in uh, excellent uh, organization of this uh, conference. Uh, the title which was uh, uh, researched by the Pakistan team was Fiscal Policy Response to COVID-19 Pandemic. And this really uh, looks into uh, the response of uh, Pakistan's government uh, using fiscal instruments during the first and second wave of COVID and what has worked, what hasn't worked and what are the lessons for the future uh, waves of COVID or similar disasters. Amid COVID-19, uh, at least uh, until the second wave, uh, economic growth had uh, plummeted to uh, negative 0.5%. Manufacturing sector was hardest hit Public investment uh, had declined, uh, given that there were other needs which government had to respond to, sort of diversion of public resources towards pandemic-related needs. Around 3 million uh, jobs were lost due to the pandemic, uh, and the proportion of those living in poverty increased between 24 to 33 percent, depending upon the uh, definition. Uh, we set out uh, after comprehensive consultations with the National Planning Commission and Federal Board of Revenue and the team initiated the study on effectiveness of fiscal policy interventions as response to the pandemic. 
we look, looked into the actual uh, uh, fiscal policy interventions which the government had undertaken to answer questions such as uh, what were the macroeconomic and welfare impacts of changes in structure and rates of uh, indirect taxes, uh, indirect and indirect taxes in federal and provincial budgets, how have these changed, uh, how have these fiscal policy changes provided relief to firms and households, how were changes in tariff policy designed, and how far these measures rescued the firms in the trade sector, and uh, what may have been the incidence of production subsidies and how far these measures supported firms in the agriculture sector. We looked into four main simulations. The first one was reduction in sales tax by 3.5% for activities under large scale manufacturing. Uh, our second uh, simulation focused on reduction in tariffs by 2% on priority agriculture and food items. Uh, this third simulation was around sales tax on uh, uh, select services, which was reduced by 3%. And fourth was a production subsidy, which was allowed to the cotton sector. And we look at the impact of all four of them separately. Our findings inform us that the growth impact of uh, 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 fiscal policy is provided to the manufacturing sector that's where the highest growth impacts are basically seen, followed by the policy measure which included reduction in tariffs and duties on the imports of agricultural inputs, agricultural uh, uh, intermediate goods and food items. We also see the investment impact of policy measures. Here, uh, the highest uh, gain has been when the tax burden on the services sector was reduced. And given that services sector contributes more than 55 percent to the, the, the national economy, the growth impact was was higher here, followed by uh, the measure which uh, aimed at reduction in uh, taxes on the manufacturing sector. In terms of the reduction in price inflation, uh, it is the first policy measure which was aimed at reducing uh, taxes for the manufacturing sector, which lends us the highest gains and uh, uh, the consumer prices fall down uh, relatively more than as seen in the other uh, simulations. Impact on trade, uh, while positive for all the simulations, uh, which include reduction in taxes for services, manufacturing, uh, reduction tariffs on agriculture and food, as well as uh, increase in production subsidy for cotton sector. However, the highest gain that one sees is uh, one, uh, when, when uh, taxes services are liberalized. Manufacturing sector imports also change uh, as a response to uh, our, our simulations. It is, uh, of course, uh, intuitive uh, given that uh, the first simulation, the first policy intervention was directly aimed at reduction in tax burden on the manufacturing sector. Here, of course, we see that as manufacturing exports go up, the the import demand of the manufacturing sector also picks up. In terms of export gains for non-manufacturing sectors, one doesn't see uh, a very large gain in agriculture, despite of the fiscal policy ease provided to this sector. But uh, for the services sector, once the general sales tax or the indirect taxes on services sector is reduced, one does see a decent export gain uh, for that sector as well. This, of course, includes uh, services subsectors like IT and ICT, uh, amongst other activities which digital enterprises are undertaking, whose output, in fact, increased uh, due to the online and remote working uh, during the pandemic. The impact on household uh, consumption, uh, one could see that uh, there is some widening of inequality here, while consumption gains are positive 
for all types of households. It is the urban households um, represented in, in all our simulations here. And we take a short term and a medium term uh, scenario here. And we could we could readily see that the gains uh, seen by, for example, uh, urban and rural poor are less than the gains seen by rural rich and urban rich. Likewise, uh, in case of uh, food consumption as well, one sees that while there are positive gains for all types of households, the gains for uh, the rich seem to be higher. So the hypothesis that pandemic may have led to some widening of inequalities seems to hold true here. We also see that in case of wages, uh, the wages of skilled workers are increasing more than the unskilled workers. In terms of gender inequalities, uh, we are mindful that due to li data limitations, we could not uh, have a gender aware uh, CGE analysis uh, for However, we do have some findings on the subject from our qualitative analysis and interviews with women-led enterprises in Pakistan. And uh, we, we do have a report from the World Bank office, which reveals how women-owned firms, uh, which are usually smaller than firms owned by men, uh, are 8% more likely to lose their uh, entire revenue during the pandemic. In the micro enterprise sector, the uncertainty was much higher for women uh, and informal enterprises. There are three policy implications coming out of our work. Uh, the first one is that there is a clear need to study the potential of all federal and provincial level taxes and what role these taxes could play in emergency times. Additional simulation exercises and future studies are required to understand if cut in compliance cost of taxes may lead to favorable gains. Second, given that we see some inequality enhancing impacts of tax policy, therefore the future exercise could offer insights into what supplementary expenditures or social protection related measures could be expanded to compensate for increase in inequalities. And finally, tax policy changes amid COVID-19 uh, haven't resulted in significant export gain for agriculture and food sector. This needs to be explored further as this sector was able to see rise in availability of important inputs. Uh, even during pandemic, uh, this sector received uh, a lot of tax uh, policy liberalization interventions as well. Additionally, local inputs were also subsidized. So these are the three main uh, key takeaways, which in the coming days we look forward to exploring further with the policymakers, particularly the National Planning Commission and Federal Board of Revenue in Pakistan. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the presentation of the key funding of our research entitled Adaptation to and Recovery from the COVID-19 Crisis in Benin. As you know, for several developing countries such as Benin, agriculture is emerging as a predominant sector for economies and social development. In Benin, the agriculture sector, like soybean sector, have many, has many challenges. For 2009, a sudden health crisis could slow down and economic activity is in its functioning. The case, this point is for coronavirus pandemic, which become a global crisis since 2020. Since the crisis, we know the decline in household income, the loss of job, and the increase in household spending. Like all countries, Benin has taken different social and economic action to help and advance of the pandemic and listen with negative effect. Then UNPS also supports its members to implement government action. But there has not yet been a study showing actual action for the benefit of producers and especially for the one of soybean production. Our main research questions are what is the producer knowledge level scale in Pratish following the COVID-19. What are the producers' perception 
and strategy developed against the effect of COVID-19. The study area is made of four departments up in the north and central part of Benin. The data will collect in a total of 19 villages and 75 soy producers were actually surveyed. The data were collected through a household questionnaire and individual questionnaire. And the analysis of data consists is in providing simple descriptive statistics. What are we finding in this research? In this research, we're finding that water access, hygiene, and sanitation conditions are not met in the surveyed household. There are gender inequality in household as well as education, training, associate members. For knowledge, attitude, and practice, we saw that the majority, 94% of soybean producers survive are aware of the existence of COVID-19. Unlike studies by Desclos and all 2020, which showed that producers doubt the existence of COVID-19 in Africa. The knowledge score are high, 8 to 9, 8 to 9 and not much different for men and women. Kabamba in all 2020 reported the same trend on the population of urban areas in Kinshasa. More than half of men and women consider COVID-19 to be a reality. Only 15% of producers believe that the crisis is likely to return in the future. In response to the COVID-19 crisis, some households have adopted various practices like barrier testing. For adaptation strategy and perception, the result is that only 6% of male and 4% of female have, benefit, have benefited from action, initiative, or external intervention related to COVID-19. The majority of respondents would like to receive more support from the government. But most of the government's support to farmers take the form of refinancing of loan granted by financial institution to production. The crackdown is not materialized. This demonstrates the inadequacy between the real needs and the corrective measure offered by governments. For producer initiative and effect of COVID-19, we can note that the few main strategies developed relate to reducing the area so and the workforce. For effect, we can note that the COVID-19 impacted both the economic and social dimension of child and men and women in target households. The perceived effects are more negative than positive. Only 13% of men and 9% of women have perceived the effect of COVID-19 on their household. Women are most affected in the household and this varies from one dimension to another, food, employment, income. For children, in household COVID-19 had more effect on education. For risk analysis, we can note that producers remain optimistic in relation to the impact of the crisis on income. COVID-19 limited the trade and migration observed in the run-up to the agricultural campaign. And producers have therefore rapidly developed over type of agricultural activity. For this result, we can conclude that this work make, made it possible to analyze the level of knowledge, attitude, and practice of soybean producers in the face of COVID-19. To analyze the strategy that the producers themselves have developed in the face of the effect of COVID-19. 
to understand the perception of what they really want to, uh, as support, their own initiative, how the complex effect of COVID-19, and there is the run in the income generating activities. The courage of out work shows significant aspect of human life will not only contribute to scientific, to scientific knowledge on the issues of crisis of COVID-19. It's also called on political decision maker to issue development action in the direction of support to small production household in order, order to improve their resilience to the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic in the Benin Republic. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone uh, for the presentation and uh, thank you. Uh, our distinguished uh, listeners. Now we have um, uh, about 10 minutes, actually about five minutes for Q&A. And uh, we will first pick the questions which are on the chat. Please uh, write questions on the Q&A because I will not be able to listen to you. But uh, we are going to start uh, with the first question that we have based on uh, Guillermo's presentation. And uh, the question is, uh, where is the line between develop, uh, developing comprehensive policies for adaptation and recovery and between maintaining the public safety and national security of countries, especially at the health level? So, uh, Guillermo, can you please unmute and uh, try to answer that? I'm sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't hear you. Can you read the question again? I'm sorry about that. Okay. Can you see the question on the Q and A? Oh. Yeah. Just yes. open the Q and A. You can see there's one question. I don't know whether there's another one now. I I cannot see any questions on the Q and A. Oh, okay. Q and A. I'm sorry. I was in the chat. Where is the line between um, developing comprehensive policies for adaptation and recovery and between maintaining public safety and national security of countries, especially at the health level? Uh, from Salam Al-Rabadi. Thank you, Salam. I think that's a, um, a very good question. I think I would, I would defer to my um, political scientist colleagues and, and, and security specialists, but I would say that um, I think that the the um, the policies for adaptation and recovery have been implemented by all types of governments in uh, in the world successfully um and some governments have been more draconian and and others have been less draconian in their measures um and i haven't seen any convincing evidence that uh, more erosion of civil liberties in the context of pandemic have been uh, have resulted in in more successful approaches. I think the pandemic has uh, has been very bad for for everyone, and, and uh, I would spend more resources in trying to find um, vaccines than in in in, sh in um, restrictive measures. But that's that's a personal uh, opinion. I wouldn't say that that comes out of the of the of the IDRC sponsored uh, PEP project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Guillermo. Vaka, do you want to say anything about that? Do you have any ideas? I don't know whether he can hear us. He's joining us remotely. Yes, I can. I can hear you. Uh, can you just repeat the question? Just for my clarity. Uh, so, sorry. Can you hear? Can you hear us, Vaka? Yes. I, yes. I, I, I can hear you. Can you can you just repeat the question for my clarity? Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, what is where is the line between developing comprehensive policies for adaptation and recovery, and between maintaining the public safety and national security of countries, especially at the health level? 
Did you get it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think very briefly, um, two things here. One is that in the case of pandemic, if I'm understanding the, 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 the question correctly, uh, we really don't know the timeline as yet. So I think the question is pointing towards a very pertinent direction uh, that the, the, the thin line between uh, uh, recovery and then, of course, uh, growth phase or coming fully out of the crisis really becomes very blurred. The line becomes blurred. And I think this is the challenge for uh, for, for, for policies aiming at adaptation that one is really learning by doing uh, as we grapple with the future waves of COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure everyone can hear you. We have another question. So again, uh, either of you can answer and we are running out of time. So the second question is, do any studies provide guidance on the adverse impact of slow recovery in countries that will not have much vaccination coverage until rate 2022 at the best. Baka, Gudiemo, did you get the question? Yes. Please go. Gudiemo, you are mute. You can unmute yourself. Um, so, we we haven't um, we haven't covered that issue. Uh, thank you, William. I think that's a very good question. Um, we haven't covered uh, different speeds of recovery as of yet, but that's certainly an angle um, we would like to to look at. Um, unfortunately, every um, every time we think we know what's going on with this pandemic, we get more surprising results. For instance, everything seemed to. Uh, uh, to show that we would have a, a, a very bad third wave of the Delta variant right now in, in, in South America. And fingers crossed that hasn't happened yet, but we had this. So um, I haven't seen any work, but I, I agree that um, perhaps the focus should now move on to um, the recovery and, and how to speed it up and how to uh, make sure that uh, it is the most uh, inclusive um, the results of the, rec the, the recovery are, are inclusive and, 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 and well spread out across societies. Okay, thank you. Maybe the last one, and I'll ask Vaka maybe to address this. Uh, I think it's universal. Uh, the question is that, uh, okay, the country specific uh, uh, presentations, I mean, evidence is very important, but are there any thoughts on how priorities are changing as the pandemic is taking so much longer than expected, and uh, there's globally and even recovery. Baka, can you attempt that? Yes, certainly. Certainly. I think um, uh, there are now good resources coming up to really track uh, the recovery from pandemic, as well as the incidence of pandemic as we face the future waves. And uh, if one is trying to look at the macroeconomic impacts uh, across the waves and as they are evolving uh, during the current wave, um, I, I find that the IMF tracker, uh, IMF COVID tracker is perhaps one of the best ones, but then you also have these sectoral trackers. So, uh, so WFP has one for, for, for tracking food security, uh, which is shared by FAO as well. And uh, uh, then, then, of course, you have a, a tracker coming up by ILO on, uh, for example, the incidents on the uh, labor market. Uh, so, yes, there are resources out there which are tracking uh, the incidents at a macro level as well as at a sectoral level. More, of course, needs to be done. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I see a final, final question, and I know we've ran out of time. It's asking, is there a conflict between the policies of economic recovery and the policies of preserving the health of citizens? Where should the priority be? Anyone who wants to try that? Yes, Guriemo? Yes, uh, th thank you, Salam, again. Um, I would say, um, with, with all due respect, I, I think this is a, a false dichotomy um, because children that don't go to school um, 
people who don't get treated for 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 cancer or or uh, other chronic diseases etc uh, because of the emergency because of of shutdowns are also uh, problems of health and problems of, of welfare that that we'll have now or or in the near future so um i think governments are 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 um experimenting and and as, as arjan says that is taking much longer and 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 uh, it, it is there's a lot of uncertainty but i think most governments in the world are are trying to balance uh the health and and welfare costs of the pandemic with the health and welfare costs uh of um containing it and and so uh, i wouldn't put it uh, directly into a, um, a, a contradiction between recovery and health. Uh, without recovery, we will have we will still have a lot of uh, the non-recovery will still have a lot of costs uh, that we must compute in the thank, balance. Thank you very much, Esther. Are you there? Do you have a final word? Maybe the three panelists. I'll just ask all of you to give maybe a parting shot if you want to make any comment. Esther, are you there? Vaka, do you have anything you want to add before we cross? Yes, just just taking lead from the last response, I think it was important. Uh, I, I, I think while, of course, health comes first, uh, the, 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 the costs which, of course, uh, health crisis imposes are also important, and many countries are unable to afford those costs. So therein, of course, a global partnership is required to protect. But then at a country level, we really now need to master how to manage these lockdowns and how to really preserve of our uh, employment, particularly in uh, the low income strata or the informal sector employment, so that the impact on livelihoods uh, is, is, is the least amid the lockdowns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vata. Esther, do you hear me? Do you have anything, any parting shot? No? Uh, Guillermo, anything? Yes? Just very briefly, and this is something we, we've been discussing with the whole uh, PEP team, um, maybe the, the silver lining, if any, of this is that um, we've seen pretty good responses all over the world in, in, in countries with different levels of development. And perhaps, um, I mean, we've seen social protection policies expanding and having better coverage uh, over the last two decades. Perhaps these will leave us with the right infrastructure to have um, better uh, prepared emergency responses, okay, for the next, I mean, there is going to be a next tsunami, a next earthquake, a next hurricane, etc., in different countries. And so perhaps this will leave us with infrastructure to better deal with these kind of, of uh, emergencies. Thank you. Thank you very much for those great thoughts. And uh, thank you, everyone. And fortunately, we have to stop now because there's a fireside chat that uh, started uh, two minutes ago. Uh, just to thank the presenters and those who attended, uh, everyone who attended, just to say that uh, we have much more than this. And uh, please visit our website uh, for more information on the work that we are doing. We are having dif difficulties. Actually, Vaka is joining via my mobile phone because he could not log in. And uh, Esther was also having difficulties, but she's in the background. So thank you, everyone. Uh, let's uh, proceed to the fireside chat. And uh, we look forward to interacting with you. Get our contact on the PEP website and feel free to send questions to us. We'll be happy to give you more information. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. You are free to leave. Bye. Jane, thank you so much for saving the session. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you. Thank you for all the trouble. Bye.